Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday to you. Thank you for joining us for our Sunday morning service here at Trinity Baptist Church. Let's open in a word of prayer, ask the Lord for His help, and then we will say our brand new verse for the month of May uh, once we uh, ask the Lord for His help in prayer. Let's, let's go to the Lord and, and ask Him uh, to help us as we uh, worship Him today. Lord, thank you for another day that you have given to us. Help us to never take that for granted, uh, another day, uh, life that you have given, uh, air to breathe, and a heart that beats in our chest. We are very thankful for your many blessings. Thank you that the Bible tells us, uh, Lord, that you daily load us with benefits. Help us, please, to be mindful of that, to remember that. And, uh, Lord, that we might rejoice in that then this morning. Help us in every aspect of the service. Lord, as we sing today, I pray that you'd help us to sing out as unto you. Help the words, Lord, as uh, they are truth, uh, according to what your word uh, would say, as, as uh, they've been uh, written, uh, really from the truths of your word. May they resonate in our hearts. I pray that you'd help it to minister to us as we are serving you and, and again, singing to you. Lord, we pray that as we are faithful in our giving, that you would uh, continue to be very faithful in your provision for us and in using us to, to help others and, uh, Lord, to take care of the needs of our church. And then we do pray that as we look into your word, you'd help us in that as well. Help us, please, to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And we ask all of these things then this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we do have a new verse. It is the month of May, and uh, it seems uh, amazing to think we're already into the month of May. And uh, where did April go? We were all, we've all been inside for so long, uh, but we do have a brand new verse. It is Romans 8 and verse number 17. So we're going to have the words up on the screen for you as we normally do. We're going to say that reference out loud together, and then the verse, and then that reference. Again, it is Romans 8 and verse number 17. Ready, begin. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Romans 8, 17. Again, our yearly theme or our, our thought for this year is with God. And uh, we see that, that phrase or that idea here in Romans 8, 17 about being with Christ. We are joint heirs with Christ and uh, boy, amazing benefits, amazing uh, things that that, that means, uh, and uh, we'll talk about that as we kind of go through the month, but I, I want you to uh, work on rem remembering this verse and even hiding it in your heart. It's just such a, such a comfort, such a help uh, as we go about our daily living. This time, we're going to sing some songs together, so uh, get your voice ready, and uh, let's participate together this morning as we sing out tremendous songs this morning, and I hope they do minister to your heart uh, as we pray and ask the Lord for His help to do. Let's uh, go into our congregational singing then. Well, good morning. Let's join together in some congregational singing. We're going to begin this morning with Nothing But the Blood, a great hymn. We'll sing through all four verses this morning. Let's sing it out together, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow, that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. I can tell you're singing well this morning. Thank you for that. We're going to turn to the little chorus, Christ is all I need. And we're going to sing the first verse and the second. Then we're just going to repeat the first verse as well to finish off. Christ is all I need. Let's sing it out this morning together. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. All I need. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. All I need. He was crucified. For me he died on Calvary, that he loved me so. This is why I know Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. Trust your understanding that and learning that even on a greater level uh, in these, uh, these strange days in which we are living grateful for who the Lord Jesus Christ is, what He does for us. Thank you for singing and uh, for your participation this morning. Well, didn't you enjoy singing those songs? Boy, they uh, are certainly a blessing to think about the truths in those songs. And it is uh, amazing how uh, music uh, does help us and, and minister to our hearts uh, as we uh, sing out and, and we have those songs in our heart, uh, so to speak, we're, we're just grateful uh, to be able to sing out to, to our God. And so thank you for your participation then this morning. We're going to move into the time when we would normally take our offering and uh, continue to be faithful in that. I'm, I'm encouraged by your faithfulness in giving uh, unto the Lord. So uh, just by way of reminder, or maybe if this is your first time that you are watching us, you're welcome to, to give. Uh, we certainly aren't... Uh, begging for your money, but if you would like to give to the Lord, you're certainly welcome to do that. You can do that securely online through our church website, uh, and you can also do that by way of mailing that in to our uh, church office, and we check those, uh, that mail daily. And then also you can drop it by in person, and uh, once again, I, just, I would encourage you to give us a call or, or a text message or, or uh, send us an email and kind of schedule a time just in case. Sometimes we're out running errands or trying to get some supplies or or if we're able to, to make a visit or, or stop by. And so if you'll let us know you're coming by, that would be a help. And that way we're sure that we're here to, to see you and, and uh, to take that, that uh, offering that you are giving. We have some special music. Again, we're thankful for those uh, in our church who are able to play and sing and provide that. And uh, so let's uh, enjoy the, the time of special music. Then we'll get into the message this morning.
Well, let's uh, grab our Bibles and let's go to the Gospel of Matthew again, Matthew 18. And we're going to begin reading in that very first verse as we've made our way now into the next chapter in our study through the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 18, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 1 this morning. And we're going to read down just a couple of verses here. And uh, we had been looking at the end of, of chapter number 17 at uh, the, the king as a citizen, so to speak. And, and we understand the, overall, um, arc, the overarching um, theme of the Gospel of Matthew is um, Jesus as the king of the Jews. And uh, Matthew is, is uh, using the Old Testament and uh, really uh, trying to help the Jewish uh, people to understand that Jesus is the Messiah who was promised all the way back in the Old Testament. And so we looked at, uh, again, the end of chapter 17, uh, Jesus kind of acting as a citizen and then teaching the disciples about how to act as a citizen in the world in which they are. And uh, just because uh, the king has come and uh, you are wanting him to set up this kingdom doesn't release you from uh, your duties as a citizen. And uh, really even the, the thought in the last part of Matthew 17 was the paying of the taxes and uh, Jesus provided uh, for that, and uh, he, he fulfilled that as well. He, he uh, uh, paid uh, his temple tax, as we saw there in the end of, of Matthew 17. Well, now in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus is giving some lessons about um, the, the, the teaching of how to be a citizen still. And, and really the idea here is the citizenship in the eternal kingdom. All right, so we've moved from uh, citizenship in the world in which we are currently to citizenship in the kingdom. And how does that operate and, and what does that look like? How should we get along with other citizens? And certainly that's in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, verse number 18 here as well. So let's read uh, verse number 1, Matthew chapter 18, and we'll get into the message this morning. And the, the idea or the title as we go through really most of this chapter is going to be citizenship in the kingdom. All right, so Matthew 18, verse number 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? It's an amazing question. <laughs> Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And Whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for helping us to know what it means to be a citizen. And then, Lord, really as we just read, how it is that we can even become a citizen of your kingdom. I pray that if there's someone this morning who is watching that's never trusted Christ, that they might understand uh, the truth about who they are and about who you are, and Lord, that they might put their trust and faith alone in you. Those of us that have trusted you, we are saved, our sins are forgiven, then Lord, please help us to understand the implications here and how something like pride, uh, boy, just permeates our life. It, it um, spreads so quickly and sometimes so quickly that we don't uh, perceive it or, or we don't, um, we don't uh, try to kill that off, so to speak, or, or ask for your help in defeating uh, that issue of pride. Help us. We'll thank you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been said, and I think very well, that pride is the mother of all sins, and there's a little bit of its DNA in all of us. Now, if I might add to that statement, I, I would agree that, that pride is the, the mother of all sins, but if we're honest, there's a little bit more than a little bit of it in us. There's a lot of pride in us. P pride is in, in each person, and it, it um, well, to use the phrase, it, it lifts up its head so often in our lives. And really, I, I, would, I would agree that I, I think pride is, is really at the root of every sin that you and I commit. Every sin that uh, we, we have committed or will commit is an issue. The issue is pride in us. We've been in Genesis chapter number 3 in our Wednesday evening Bible study. And we understand that uh, as Adam and Eve are confronted with temptation there, Satan is playing on the matter of pride. And he's trying to get them to understand, well, God doesn't like you. He doesn't love you. He's not, he doesn't have your best interests in, in, uh, in mind. 
He, he is holding something back from you, and he's trying to get them to question God's goodness. Well, he does the same with you and me, and he, he again, he plays off of our, our pride. And so pride certainly shows itself in the life of these disciples. And we read another one of those instances here in, in Matthew chapter 18. And I think that we can be thankful as we read this that it's not you and, I, and my life that is here on these pages that is open for everyone to see, because if it is... Ugh, it would, ugh, that's, that would be terrible. I would hate that. But I'm grateful that the Bible doesn't hide uh, the, even the motives of these disciples and what was motivating them to do what they did and to ask the questions that they did. And certainly we see that again here in this, this account. So just after Jesus has taught his disciples about the different kinds of citizenship in the last part there, as we said in Matthew chapter 17, and about the responsibilities of what being a good citizen is like, we find these disciples, in fact, just as, as Jesus is giving this teaching, notice the first phrase there in, in verse 1 of Matthew 18, at the same time. So, so just as, as they're going through these lessons, at the same time, in the very first verse here, these disciples are being concerned about their status in this kingdom that, that Jesus has been teaching about and speaking about. At the same time as Jesus has said um, he is going to suffer and be betrayed and, and crucified and, and then risen again, at the same time that they're learning that, hey, Jesus, we, we just want you to, to, to uh, straighten this out for us. Who is going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven? In fact, we learn from Mark's gospel and also Luke's gospel of, of the account of this, this, uh, this event that, that is taking place here, that there's a, a question, uh, again, in, in those passages that the disciples are asking, and it results from an argument that they are having amongst each other about this, this subject. They were questioning who is the greatest, and they're fighting about it amongst each other. And now, you can read that in Mark chapter number 9. You can read that in Luke chapter number 9. Now, Jesus, because he knows everything, and he's omniscient, he knows what these disciples are fighting about. And, and you had to think, boy, this is just grieving his heart to, to understand that he's taught them now three times about his suffering and death and, and burial and resurrection and yet their concern is all about themselves. So they're fighting about it. Jesus knows what they're fighting about. He knows their motives. And, and in Mark's gospel, you'll read there that Jesus asked them, hey, what were you discussing? Or what were you arguing about as we were making our way? And they keep quiet, Mark writes. They, they held their peace because they realized, mm, uh, if, if we tell him, he's going to realize how rotten we are. And they, they didn't really fully understand that he already knew uh, what they were discussing, what they were fighting about. Now, Matthew 17 again. Uh, look, look up, maybe just across the page or up on the page there. Look back at verses 22 and 23. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. They're sorrowful for what Jesus is saying in verses 22 and 23. But boy, that doesn't last long. When their mind goes toward the things of the eternal kingdom again, and all of the glories that, that in their mind will be a part of that, that their selfishness, their pride takes over once again. And it's, it's like a matter of minutes almost, it seems, as you read the account that, boy, the sorrowful, well, we're not sorrowful any longer, we're now concerned about number one or, or concerned about ourselves, right? So that's what makes this question in verse number one so amazing. They had just been told about his suffering and death, and yet they're so enamored with their own thoughts of prestige and glory and position in this new kingdom that they're arguing about their respective positions. Where will you be in the kingdom? Where will I be in the kingdom? No, no, I'm going to be before you. I, I've, I've done more things, and I'm part of Jesus' inner circle. And you can just imagine all of those discussions. And even again, after Jesus asked them what they're fighting about, they still have a desire to prove who is right in this, this, this discussion, this argument, that, uh, well, Matthew tells us here in the first verse, they just come out and ask Jesus very boldly, who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Wow. Wow. Now, 
we would condemn these disciples, and before I guess we, we kind of get too far in doing that, let's bring this truth to bear in our own lives. All right, let's make some application here. We, we understand exactly what Jesus has done for us, all right? We understand, because we're on this side then of this event, of, of Jesus' death and burial and resurrection. We're on the other side of that, and we know exactly what He has done for us. These here, these disciples, they didn't fully understand it this time, and, and yes, they are arguing about it. They're, they're concerned about what their place is, but what about us? We're on the other side. We know all of these things that Jesus has done. We're grateful, hopefully, for those things. Many of us have even put our trust in those things. We're relying on Jesus Christ for our salvation, and yet we can be found arguing about what our place is. Oh, well, I'm better, or I'm, I'm acting better. I'm, I'm, I've got a better set of standards or morals than this person over here, and so I, my status with the Lord must be higher. I, I must have a, a greater response time in my prayers than, than uh, you know, my friend over here, or my neighbor over here, or my fellow church member who sits, you know, three rows behind me, or whatever the case may be. So they're, they're fighting, and they're, they're still trying to prove this, and just like them, we can find ourselves doing the same thing, thinking more about ourselves than we think about Him, what He desires from us. And, and we place, honestly... And so often, so little importance on things like humility and submission and obedience because to us and in our society, those things don't add up to success, right? Uh, you don't make your way up the corporate ladder by being submissive necessarily or by being humble. Uh, oftentimes, that rat race, if we want to call it that, is uh, won by those who... Think about taking care of themselves first. And it's, it's so, so sad. We live in a time that, that's quick to admire and even applaud uh, the, those who are prideful in our society. Um, sports stars, movie stars, whatever. whatever the, pick an industry, to be quite honest. And we're quick to admire and applaud those who, who are, are a bit prideful and the only time we don't admire their pride is when we think we are better than them, right? Um, we, we even put ourselves in front of them. Well, you know, they're pretty prideful, and I'm certainly not like that. No, you even saying that means you're prideful, right? And it's, it's shameful, to be quite honest. Now, I want to read you a, a verse from Isaiah. Isaiah chapter number 66, and just a, a tremendous book is the book of Isaiah, tremendous a prophecy there in Isaiah. And Isaiah was a prophet to the, the nation of Judah, that southern kingdom that had separated off from the northern ten tribes of Israel. And Isaiah lives in the time when, when God is using him as a prophet to give a prophetic message to his people in Judah that judgment is coming because you, you are prideful, you're stubborn, you're stiff-necked, you're, you're not worshiping me in the way that you should. I'm not having really any effect on your life. You're just going through the motions. You're just going through these, these traditions, but it's not affecting your life. It's not, you're not being pointed to a coming Messiah because it's, it's become all about you and your will, your way, what you want to do. Isaiah 66, and the second verse in Isaiah 66, Isaiah 66 2, specific, uh, specifically the last part of that verse. Listen what, what is said here. But to this man will I look. This is God speaking to his people. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Boy, there's a lot there. But what I want us to see is the truth that what draws the look of God upon our lives, what brings God's gaze in my life is humility, right? But to this man will I look, God says, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. So, again, the immediate context of this verse is to the Jews, the, the people of earth who had a unique identity. They, they were chosen by Almighty God. They, they possessed the temple 
and they possessed the law of God. They, they, were, sanct- they were set apart by God, just, just special people, but they were not trembling at God's word. They had the temple, they had the word of God, but they weren't trembling at it. It wasn't affecting their life. They had put themselves over the top or in the place of God's authority in their life. They had everything going for them, but they lacked what was most important in God's sight, being humble, being of a contrite spirit, right? So now back to Matthew chapter number 18. And and as we get back there, I just want to remind us of a verse in Proverbs, Proverbs 13 and verse number 10. Boy, I use this so often And I really need to use it in my own life as well. Here's what Solomon said. Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. So in Matthew 18, these Jewish disciples were arguing with one another, again, because of pride. And rather than realize their their sinfulness, the, 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 the wickedness of their own ways, They boldly ask, they they come to the Lord and they ask the question, who is more important than others? Am I more important than, than, than James or John or Peter or whoever? Ah, can you imagine what the Lord must have been thinking? Can you imagine what he's thinking of us as well? Really, he he can he can be discouraged with that, if that's even the the right phrase. I think he's He's brokenhearted over our pride. I don't think there's any question about that. And perhaps the most important or or interesting part of this passage is how Jesus responds to the question. Look at verse number 2 of Matthew chapter number 18. Jesus calls this small child over to him, and he puts this little boy. Well, let's just read verse 2. And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of of them. So he puts this, this little boy in the middle of these arguing disciples, and he begins to give to them, and by the way, give to us, boy, just a wonderful object lesson, something to, get, to capture our mind, to help us to understand or to think through this with the mind of the Lord. All right? So, so here's kind of the first, the first thing that Jesus is going to teach these disciples, is that humility and conversion are necessary to even enter into this kingdom. Humility and conversion are necessary to even enter into the kingdom. So he's called this little child in the midst, and he set this little boy in front of them all. Notice what he says in verse number 3, Matthew 18, verse 3. And said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So what has Jesus done? He's changed the nature, so to speak, of the question that the disciples ask in verse number one. The disciples' question is is, uh, a degree of greatness, so to speak, right? Who's going to be greater? What's the pecking order here? What's it going to be in the kingdom? And, and, And since they were Jesus' closest friends, they were Jesus' closest followers, Surely, in their mind, they would have these exalted positions in, in the kingdom, that they would be, be some of the, the best leaders or some of the greatest leaders, some of the, the ones of greatest influence in the kingdom. But the, the question in, in all their minds is, yeah, but who's going to be first? We, we know we're, we're all going to be there. We know we're, we're all going to be ruling. But really, come on, who, who's going to be your right-hand man? Who's going to be a number, a number one? And the disciples are making the assumption that greatness was all they had to worry about. They're, they're, they're in their mind, they're convinced that the really, we're already in. The only thing that we have to be concerned about is who's going to impress Jesus the most so that they can be kind of top of the heap. And they assumed they would just be in the kingdom. But again, Jesus changes the... the uh, the nature of the question, and he explains to these men in verse number three, and again, he explains to all of us, that unless we are completely changed, unless there's something radical that takes place in our life, unless our entire nature is, is altered or changed, we will not even enter into the kingdom. In other words, forget about who's going to be important. You need to be concerned about being there at all. You forget about what the pecking order is. You be concerned about even being able to step foot into the kingdom. Boy, for you and me, 
rather than worrying about what my rewards are going to be or how great heaven is, let's make sure we're, we're going to be there at all, right? Just because you're a member of the church, just because you've, you've been in church for, for so many years, just because you've served or taught a Sunday school class or, or helped on a bus route or, or fed the poor, whatever, doesn't give you entrance into heaven. No, no, we have to humble ourselves, and that's exactly what Jesus is telling these men. I read a quote from, from one commentator on the Gospel of Matthew, and I thought it was just a tremendous thought. I want to read it to you. He said, big-headed people can't fit through the narrow gate. Boy, so true. Big-headed people can't fit through the narrow gate, right? You remember what Jesus teaches, that narrow is the gate, straight is the way, but big-headed people, those who are prideful, those who think they've got it all figured out and, and Jesus is just going to allow them entrance into heaven or into the kingdom because of who they are or what they've done, no, you're not going to fit through. Humility was the exact opposite of the disciples' greedy pride that we read about here in Matthew chapter number 18. Now, as we think about entrance into the kingdom and the, the issue of conversion, we understand that the, the, the concept of repentance is a necessary part of our conversion to faith in Christ. Acts chapter number 3, verse number 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. By the way, that's the disciples preaching because they had finally learned the lesson that it wasn't about who was greatest. The issue was, I need to make sure I'm converted. So they would preach, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Luke chapter number 13, verse number 3. I tell you nay, this is Jesus preaching, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So what is repentance? Repentance is a, a changing of our mind re regarding our current state, right? Instead of thinking we're, we're okay as we are, it's a changing of mind about our current state and realizing the need to come to God alone for forgiveness and salvation. Realizing that the way of, of, of my, my plan, my will, my way, my standard of entrance doesn't match up. And my mind has to be changed to come to God alone for forgiveness, to come to God alone for, for salvation. So these disciples then, in Matthew 18, verse number 1, they needed to repent. They needed to change their mind about this issue of, of greatness. They needed to confess or agree with God about their sinful pride. And be, Jesus says, verse number 3, be converted, which literally means, that word converted literally means, again, to turn in order to enter the kingdom that Jesus will establish. And guess what? You and I must do the same exact thing. We're in the same sinful state as these disciples until we turn, we repent. Our mind is changed and we understand our sinfulness and it separates us from God. And the only way to meet the standard of perfection for heaven is to have God make us to be, declare us to be righteous. God says that all of us have sinned, Romans 3, 23. Sin is the breaking of God's law. That's what John would tell us in 1 John 3 and verse number 4. I'm transgressing or I'm breaking God's law. You and I aren't the standard of perfection. God is. And so our sin brings what? Our sin brings a consequence, which the Bible says is death, Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. But the gift that Jesus has purchased for everyone who will accept him, everyone who will come to him and confess their sin, agree with him about it, repent, change their mind about it, and put their trust in him alone for forgiveness and salvation. The free gift then is eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So anyone who desires to have God's forgiveness, his salvation, must humble themselves, believe what God has said about these matters, confess their sinfulness, again, agree with God about it, and trust or rely fully and only on Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for salvation from death, from salvation from the punishment that our sin deserves. And that is how anyone, anyone can enter into the kingdom of God.
I read several books about humility and just that concept because it's so, I know it's in my own life, that, that issue of pride and that I need to be humble before the Lord. And, and one of my favorite authors on the subject is a man named C.J. Mahaney. He writes the book, Humility, True Greatness. Uh, one of the quotes that he said, or really his, his ideas as he kind of starts the book defining what humility is, he says, humility is honestly assessing ourselves in light of God's holiness and our sinfulness. I'll, I'll read it again. Humility is honestly assessing ourselves in light of God's holiness and our sinfulness. In other words, when God is the measuring stick, if we're honest, where do we measure up as far as perfection goes? We're not even close. True humility is, is rooted in realizing both God's holiness and my sinfulness. And without an honest awareness of both of these realities, that I am prideful, I am a sinner, without realizing that, and then without realizing all of the fullness of God's holiness, then every bit of our self-evaluation, so to speak, every bit of what we think about ourselves is going to be skewed if we don't have the proper perspective. And we will fail to understand, we will fail to practice what true humility is. Now, we've been talking about it in the measure of salvation, and certainly that, that's a necessary topic. That's how we enter into the kingdom. But what about after salvation? Well, now, now, I, I, okay, I'm saved. I'm entering into the kingdom. Now, what does God think about me? No, nope, still don't get it. We still don't understand that. So what about this child? What about the, the concept of children then in verse number three? Well, let's think about it. Jesus calls this little child, sets him in the midst of these arguing disciples, these prideful disciples, and he wants them to understand the, the truth that a, a little child is simple and dependent and helpless. They're not sinless, right? They're, we're, we're all born in iniquity. They're, they're not naturally unselfish. Hello, if you've ever had children or if you've ever been a children, you weren't naturally unselfish. And then they display, oh man, they display their fallen nature from the earliest ages, right? But they are naive and unassuming and I mean that in the best way, right? They're, they're, they don't know. They don't understand all those things. They're, they're quick to trust quite often. They trust others and they, they don't have ambitions for greatness, right? It's not in them to, they're not born just coming out trying to climb the corporate ladder. It, that's, that's not what we're, we're born with. That comes later, right? As our pride even builds more and more. So Jesus would, would tell these disciples, first of all, that humility and conversion are necessary to even enter into the kingdom. And then secondly, humility is required for, for greatness in the kingdom. What the disciples were after in verse number one is only going to come through humility. You, you enter through humility and conversion, and then really the concept of you, you being exalted, if you want to say it that way, in the kingdom is through humility. The way up is down. That verb that Jesus uses in verse number 4 of Matthew 18, that verb, shall humble. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself literally means to, to make low. So in God's eyes, the one who lowers himself is the one who becomes elevated. Now, in the day of this, the writing of this, this gospel, in the Jewish culture, and in, really in the, the culture in general, Children were about the lowest on the totem pole, right? They, they were the lowest in social status. So can you see, as Jesus brings this little child, this little, little boy, into the midst of them, can you see how he's directly speaking to the question the disciples have been fighting about in verse number one? Who's going to be greatest? Be like this little child. <laughs> well, that doesn't make sense. It's a kid. He he's, he's the lowest of the low. He, he can't even do anything for himself. Yeah, exactly. This little child that, that Jesus has brought to himself has displayed the elements of humble faith. Jesus called the little child in verse number two, and, and he comes unto him, and he set him in the midst of them. Now, think about the elements of, of humble faith. Listening to Jesus, trusting Jesus, and obeying Jesus. That's what this little child does in verse number two child, that's what you and I need to do as well. 
yes for salvation. I need to humble myself and trust the Lord. I need to be obedient to Him. I need to listen to Him. Okay? After conversion, after salvation, guess what my responsibility is? Listening to Jesus, trusting Him, being obedient to Him. Jesus would say a little bit later on, just a couple of chapters after this, in chapter 20 and verse number 27, Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. And notice verse 5 of Matthew 18, and we'll, we'll finish. Whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Humility is a source of a right relationship with God, and it is a source of a right relationship with other people. People, whoso shall receive one such little child, one, one like this, one that's humble themselves, one that's in the kingdom, you receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. So, okay, I want right relationship with, with God. I have to humble myself. I have to repent. I, I have to come to Him for salvation, for forgiveness of sins, for salvation. I have to humble myself. Then, as far as my citizenship goes, once I enter into the kingdom, now the way is not fighting for who's number one. It's not fighting for influence or for God's attention. No, no. It is this issue of humility, that I would treat other people around me in humility and in grace and with mercy and with love as well, because that's how I entered that's how they entered. That's what I should be doing. That's how my life should be characterized is through this issue of humility. Humility that pleases God is not thinking you are worthless, right? That's not what God is asking us to do. It's not the way of a poor self-esteem. That, that's not humility. It is understanding the truth of your own sinfulness, including the issue of pride, and how that Sin keeps us from a relationship with God. It is understanding that only through God that we can accomplish His will for our lives. We are reliant upon Him. We're not reliant upon ourselves, upon our own strength. Now, there's a verse that we're going to end with, and it, it, you've heard me say it before. We're going to keep on saying it because we need to keep on hearing it. It's 1 Peter 5 and verse number 5. Here's what Peter says. By the way, Peter who's one of these disciples in Matthew 18, verse number 1, who's fighting for position, fighting for prestige, fighting for that, uh, that uh, spot that is the closest to the Lord, that has the most influence. The same Peter who stuck his foot in his mouth so many times, who's, who's, who's rebuking the Lord in Matthew chapter 16, who's correcting God in the flesh. Thankfully, Peter had to learn the lesson. 1 Peter 5, verse number 5, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. I don't know about you, but I want to be on the receiving end of God's grace. I want God's hand of grace and mercy upon me. And the Bible makes it very, very clear. How can we have that? Humble yourself. Again, not, not make yourself have a poor self-esteem. You've been created in God's image. He loves you. He made you just the way you are, to be quite honest. But he understands you have a need to turn from your sinfulness and turn to him for salvation so that he can make you to be what he wants you to be. We have to humble ourselves. If you've never trusted in Christ, you can make that decision today. In fact, uh, in just a moment, we're going to spend some time in prayer, and we would encourage you to, to call out to the Lord. The, the Bible says in Romans 10, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That can be done through what we might call a prayer. Well, I don't know how to pray. It's not in how well you pray or even the words that you use. You have to understand you're a sinner. Tell that to the Lord. I understand I'm a sinner. You have to ask Him for forgiveness. Lord, forgive me of my sinfulness. You have to put your trust, your reliance in Jesus Christ alone. Just tell Him the best you know how, that's what you are doing. And the Bible says, when you'll do that from your heart, that He'll come, He'll forgive your sins, He'll save your soul. In just a moment, we're going to pray. At that time, you're welcome to pause this video recording. And you can pray and you can ask the Lord. And if you do, 
we want to rejoice with you. If you'd let us know you've made that decision, boy, that would be the greatest thing uh, we, can, we can ever do is to trust Christ for salvation, for forgiveness. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful uh, for your goodness to us. Thank you for teaching us this truth about humility and our need to, to come to you. I pray for that one who's never done that. Lord, may they make that decision this morning. Help them, please, uh, to understand their sinfulness. But, Lord, the gift that you want to give them of forgiveness and salvation. And I pray for your help that they might make that decision today. Those of us then, Lord, that have trusted you, we have entered into the kingdom through Jesus Christ. Help us, please, to have an attitude of humility. Boy, work that pride out of us. Help us, please, to humble ourselves, to submit ourselves to you. Lord, to, to act in humility toward our fellow brothers and sisters in the church, in the Lord. Help us. Boy, we need such help. And we'll thank you. Lord, we love you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, we want to say thank you for being a part of our Sunday morning service at Trinity Baptist Church. And I know some of you might not be able to watch this on Sunday morning, uh, but uh, we are glad whenever you're able to, to watch this and, and uh, be a part of our service. We're, we're so glad to have you as a part here and just a, a quick announcement about um, this week and then uh, into next Sunday. Uh, this week on, on Wednesday, uh, we'll have a missionary, and uh, he's already um, given his uh, message, and so we'll, we'll have that to, by way of uh, video streaming. And so we we'll look forward to have you um, listen in on that missionary to Mindanao in the, the Philippine Islands. And so uh, hopefully you'll, you'll be able to join with us and uh, be a part in that service. Again, that's Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And then next Sunday morning, next Sunday is Mother's Day, May 10th. And for our Sunday morning service, we're going to have service here in our church building. We're, we're uh, able to do that, or really, uh, we, we've kind of come to that uh, point when we think there's some, there's, uh, some safety and in, in ability to do that. And so we're going to have our service again next Sunday morning here in the building, just at 11 o'clock, no Sunday school hour. There'll be no nursery, no children's church. We'll all be together in the auditorium. But as much as we can, we want to strongly suggest and encourage those who are older in our congregation. That is, uh, well, this, the guidelines have been 65 and older, as well as those who uh, have uh, not been feeling well. Maybe you've had a fever or a cough or a sneeze or any of those kind of things uh, that are kind of illness-related. In the last uh, few days, in fact, I think the, the guidelines are in the last 14 days, we're going to ask you to stay home also. If you've got any kind of ill feeling and uh, fever up above, you know, around 99 or above, we want to encourage you to stay home, please, to, to try to, to uh, lower um, the, uh, the, the possible spread of anything, not just coronavirus, but anything like that. And uh, so if you would uh, just enjoy the service from home, we, we will... Uh, or we're, we're trying to, or working toward having a, a bit of live stream, and it will be a little bit different than our normal service as far as the view of it, uh, because we're going to be doing that from a phone. We don't have uh, the internet speeds to do that through our, our regular cameras. But if you'll join us for the, the live stream service, we'd love to have you uh, in that service. We're going to space out uh, kind of physical distance in our auditorium. So that will look like uh, family units, people living together in the same household. You'll be able to sit together and please do so. And uh, then we'll keep about a pew or so space you know, uh, between one another. And uh, so if you can keep at least six feet away from anyone else, uh, we, we certainly want to abide by that if, if we can. You're welcome to wear uh, a mask if that makes you feel more comfortable. Um, we will have uh, our ushers and, and folks like that really just kind of helping with seating. Uh, we won't pass the offering plate. We'll just have a, a, a collection plate or a collection box at the back. You can drop your offering in there so we won't be passing anything. We won't have, pass out bulletins. In fact, we'll use uh, the, the screens for, for hymns uh, just so we're not uh, kind of handling things uh, right now. And just trying to do the best that we can while we're still able to meet and to do the best to not to transfer anything by touching those things. So if you can join with us, you're, you're not uh, uh, maybe immunocompromised. You, you don't have uh, some of those uh, kind of conditions health-wise that would uh, make you more susceptible to catching something. I want to encourage those folks to stay home also. But if you're able to be here, we'd love to see you. Uh, we'll have a gift for all of our mothers. And again, if you are a mom 
and you're not able to be here, maybe you're in one of those categories, uh, we will be sure and, and drop off that gift to you. We'll just drop it by your, your home or your porch and to leave it for you to, to get. And uh, I, I think you'll enjoy it. I trust you'll enjoy it. But uh, we, we still want to remember you and recognize you. And we're thankful for our moms. And uh, so many of you have done such, so much work uh, these past uh, few weeks. And I know you're tired and, and ready to get out. I, I know. And uh, so we, we want to show our appreciation. We love you and, and are thankful for you. So just, uh, again, that 11 o'clock hour, Sunday morning, and then next Sunday night, we'll be just in this format again. We'll go back to our video service right at 6 o'clock on Sunday evening. So Wednesday evenings and Sunday evenings, uh, for now, as we kind of make this uh, kind of in stages, so to speak, we're just going to have our morning service at the church on Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, and then, uh, again, no nursery, no children's church, no Sunday schools, and then uh, we will have our evening service and Wednesday evening services by way of video. So uh, if you have any questions, you're welcome to call, send a text, email, whatever you'd like, and I'll be happy to answer any way that I can. And we just feel like uh, leadership men have met and feel like this is the best way moving forward. So hopefully you'll be able to be a part of that uh, soon if you're not able to this, this coming Sunday. Let's be praying for one another and encouraging one another, serving one another, and uh, checking up on, on folks still. Let's continue to do that. Thank you again for joining us. Let's have a word of prayer and we will dismiss for this morning. Lord, we're thankful for your goodness, again, your kindness to us. And we do pray that you'd help us, even this week, as we make preparations to kind of come back into the building, at least for one service a week. Pray that you'd give us safety and, and a protection. Help us, Lord, as uh, we make our way through this week. I pray that you'd help us to be a witness and a testimony. Please help us in this matter of humility. We need help with this on a daily basis, even a minute-by-minute -minute basis, so help us. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to, to witness to someone who you would bring in our, our path, so to speak, or you'd, you'd uh, allow us to, to speak with or, or uh, to, to even communicate with. Lord, help us to be a testimony to them about uh, who you are, about uh, what you've done, and what you want to give to them in salvation. We'll thank you. We love you. Thank you for loving us, and Lord, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you are dismissed. We hope to see you tonight for our evening service.